Well, let, let, let's get into because I want to talk a little bit about the same language we kind of use towards the, the, the neo-fascist, the problem I think you could have, and I'm glad you explained that, but I'm a little bit bothered by that same language towards Vladimir Putin. Putin's a thug. Putin's a gangster. I mean, if you're going to be the president of the United States, how are you going to sit down with a man across from you who you're supposed to get rid of, getting rid of nuclear weapons and, and try to convince him of that? How are you going to talk peace when you're saying, and, and I want your, I, the, plain and simple, this question, did Vladimir Putin have a choice to do what he did in Ukraine? Because I don't think people are kind of uh, really talking about the crux of what's going on. I don't know if people understand. Do you think that Vladimir Putin had a choice to not go into Ukraine? Well, I appreciate the question, though, brother, because, I mean, you got a, a number of different levels here. Uh, first thing to keep in mind is that you've got American imperial provocation with the promise that NATO would not move one inch toward Russia. The American empire reneged on that promise. A number of decades later now, 13, 14 countries are now part of NATO, which were formerly associated with the Soviet Union. So it's very clear that that is a massive provocation. I've said on many, many, many occasions that if there were missiles in Mexico or Canada, the United States government would blow them to smithereens. Why? Because empires behave that way. And America is an empire. Now, there's no equivalency between the Russian Empire and the American Empire in terms of power. There's no doubt about that. There's no equivalency at all. But at the same time, there's also the, the, the fact of coming out of the KGB and a whole host of other trajectories of, of Putin himself, maybe calling him a, a, a gangster or uh, calling him a, I've never used the word thug, calling him a gangster might be viewed as just some kind of... Um, uh, uh, symbolic gesture to the liberal uh, and neoliberal <laughs> circle, but it's, I'm concerned about Russian brothers and sisters, just like I'm concerned about U Ukrainian brothers and sisters, just like I'm concerned about anybody else. And when you have mechanisms of repression anywhere, I'm going to call that into question so that the, you have provocation. We're not moving an inch, 14 countries now with U S missiles, right on the borders of the Russian empire, Putin's back is against the wall. Now I viewed invasion and occupation of any country, the violation, not just of national sovereignty, I view it as a crime against humanity. So that the question becomes, you got a larger US American imperial backdrop, pushes the Russian empire against the wall. He responds with this invasion and occupation. And what do I call for? Ceasefire stop the war, sitting down with, yes, sitting down with Putin, sitting down with the Chinese, sitting down with the Turks, sitting down with the Ukrainians to generate a, di a diplomatic strategy, a diplomatic process to stop the suffering. I am concerned about the suffering of Ukrainian brothers and sisters. I'm in solidarity with the Russians who are actually going against the war because that takes courage. But that doesn't mean that we downplay the role of the, of the American imperial project. NATO historically has been an instrument of American imperial power, of American global power. That doesn't yeah. mean that Putin doesn't take some responsibility. He takes responsibility res given his response to provocation and the ways in which that's generated this human suffering, in this case, Ukrainian brothers and sisters suffering so again it's a matter of trying to be honest and truthful about the historical backdrop the present moment and how do we bring the war to an end because it's on the road to nuclear exchange on the road to nuclear holocaust okay but i want to know what the alternatives were here because i'm not saying this because I just like Vladimir Putin. I want to be accountable for what our country's done. And you talked about the NATO encroachment. But what about the 2014 coup when we removed the government that was there and put in a puppet government where Victoria Newland and Jeffrey That's Pyatt right. were on the Maidan handing out cookies? That's right. We also got MiG-1 and 2, but we also have the OSCE talking about the bombing 
that was intensified in the Donbass. Now, we have 14,000 civilians, mainly civilians, killed in the Donbass since we put in the puppet government and we armed these Nazis. When he started upping the bombing again, and it was a very apparent that they were going to go in, Putin, once again, being very passive, moved his troops to the border. He then met with Biden in Geneva, and he talked about whatever. Nothing came about it, but it seemed yeah. like, you know, they were whipping the European countries to say, hey, listen, if Putin goes in, agree to go with sanctions on, with us on them, and then all of a sudden they up the bombing again. And we have heard from testimony, Fiorella is not here today, she's been to the Donbass before. We've talked to people who went to the Donbass. Colonel McGregor said that he had talked to some people, said, thank God you guys, the Russians, came in because they were about to slaughter us. It would have been genocide. So what alternatives did Putin have to not go in? Let's not forget, Dr. West, it was eight years. Mainly the, mush the Russian population was saying, why are you dragging your feet? Even Yanukovych, when he was fleeing in 2014, said, Vladimir, you're going to have to get involved because they're going to go right there. These people hate the Russians, and they're going to slaughter them. What alternatives did Putin have? And if we don't accept the fact that we, we didn't just provoke him, we held the gun to his head. We pushed him into this thing. If we don't take accountability for that, what does that say about us as a country? Well, I mean, what it says about us is that we're hypocrites. What it says about us is that we'll rationalize our innocence even when we contribute to the devastation and to the catastrophe. No doubt about that. But I, 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 I do want to resist the notion of uh, somehow saying that the um, that Putin has no responsibility for the criminal invasion. I, I think that there, it, one of the reasons why we want to learn from each other, I mean, you're, you're saying he pursued every nonviolent alternative possible before he was pushed into this criminal invasion and occupation. Now, if I could be convinced of that, then in fact, I would have to rethink it. I would have to reevaluate where I am. But I'm, I'm convinced that the major responsibility is the American imperial provocation. By provocation, I'm using that in the broadest sense. That includes 2014. That includes the, the, the coup. That includes a variety of different steps that pushes Russian elites yeah. against the wall. Uh, but but, but I, I'm still I, I still think that the you know, this this sense of trying to absolve Putin of any responsibility I'm not convinced of that I still think that that there's a there's a sense in which the American Imperial project sits at the center but Russia is a, a is also an empire. It has its own sub-imperial sensibilities, sub-imperial strategies, and so forth. And I think that that is not something to completely erase or eliminate. Now, am I being fair to your position? Are you asking me? I I I think you're wrong because I don't look at them as an empire. I look at them as more of a superpower. I look at China. I don't look at them as an empire. I look at more oh, of them oh, as a no, superpower. Oh, no, yeah, we, no, yeah, we disagree. Wait, what, what's the difference in your view between a superpower Well, the empire and an is ever-expanding, imperialism, where we have bases all over the place. You know we have 800 bases across the globe. Oh, no, we're not talking about American empire. Yeah. We know that's the case. China you know, has what? I'm talking Three? about the history of China, the history of Russia. Is there a history of the, an, an expansion and the subjugation of peoples? There is a history of absolutely of, in both in both cases. That's, that's present day, saying. though, present day, there's action and there's reaction. And yes, China yes. and Russia are simply reacting to the actions of the empire. You you know as well as I do, Doctor yes. West. We go into yes. a country. We go we go in there with a missile, a gun, and our monetary system, and we force these countries. Because I'm going to talk about Latin oh, America Rex, right now. Absolutely. China goes in with their bank account. Build a road, build a dam. You know, Russia, Putin, the Russian Federation just squashed, uh, uh, I believe, in another in an African country, their debt. He just squashed it completely. So, I mean, I think there's a big difference between calling, you know, saying that we're on the same level. That's what I always have. No, no, but see, I, 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 yeah. I, I'm with, I, and my dear brother Baraka has, has, has corrected me on this. I do not believe there's an equivalency between 
the major empire in the history of the world and what you could call sub-imperial projects or those countries that have big have our empires in their formation that still have certain imperial sensibilities. I mean, I don't think China is going into Africa based solely on their humanitarian concerns. No, their particular form of Chinese imperial presence does not take the same form as the U.S. U.S. is more raw than the Chinese. And these are decisions made by elites, most of them neo-colonial elites in Africa, as how they transact between these empires. One of the things we've seen in the Ukrainian situation is what? Most of the African countries are pulling, are, are holding back. American imperial elites are upset about that. No, these African elites are in their own distinctive way, exercising their own sense of freedom and sovereignty as they transact with the Chinese. Now, of course, at the same time, many of those elites in Africa are also corrupt. Are they speaking to the needs of their own poor and working people? Often not at all. That's in the case of South Africa. South Africa has spent so much time with Man Mandela and the others. And what happens? The neoliberal elites take over there. We, you know, we won't go into all of that. But I'm, I'm glad to see them taking a stand against the U.S. imperial project. But it's not as if I'm going to allow them off the hook either. We have to be morally consistent. The truth sets us free, which means that the integrity and the consistency has to be pursued. I hear you. I hear you.